Okay, let's try another practice exam. Here we have a transformation. We've got starting material and some reaction conditions. We want to say what we get. So we've got an organocuprate here. Uh, we've got an organocuprate, so we do have to remember what that is. Uh, that would be uh, this copper atom, this copper anion, covalently bound to these two alkyl groups, and then the lithium ion is the counter ion to the co uh, copper anion. So what this is, is a source of alkyl nucleophile. So the alkyl nucleophile will be one of these two alkyl groups, in this case a phenyl group, and that will go and perform SN2. That is what organocuprates do. I have a tutorial on this if you uh, need some clarification. And this is what we're going to get. We just put the phenyl where the uh, iodine is. Uh, and so that is the same as this. We could actually go and draw the benzene ring itself. Whoops. So either way you want to draw that, you can represent that pH as phenyl or draw the uh, full product there. So we're just recognizing that we're delivering this phenyl nucleophile uh, over here to do SN2. Okay, now for this next one, this looks pretty straightforward. This, uh, as we can immediately tell, is just going to be a straightforward SN2 reaction. We have an excellent SN2 nucleophile, uh, and so that is going to act as a nucleophile. We've got a great leaving group right here, this iota group. So we're just going to have our, our uh, nucleophile attack and displace the iodine, and we will get our product. And we do have to recall that we're going to have inversion of stereochemistry, right? This is going to be a backside attack, and we're going to get the CN nucleophile, uh, the, we're going to get the nitrile on there, but it'll be on the wedge bond because of the angle it had to attack in order to uh, uh, access the LUMO, which was 180 degrees away from that carbon leaving group bond. So this will be our product for this SN2 reaction. Okay, next up, this is a quick one. We just want to remember what this reagent does. Whenever we see PBr3 on an alcohol, right, if we have an alcohol and we're going to treat with PBr3, we are just going to turn that uh, hydroxyl into a bromine atom. And the other thing we have to remember is that we will do so with retention of stereochemistry. So we had a dash bond there, and we will remain, it will remain a dash bond here, just with a bromine instead of the hydroxyl. So this is very com this is a very common one uh, when we uh, in multi-step synthesis, let's say we do a Grignard and we get an alcohol, but then we want to do some more chemistry. We can use PBr3 to turn that into a bromo group from which we can eliminate, we can do all kinds of other things. So that's a great reagent. We should have a flashcard with that one on there and know what it does. Okay, now we have this cyclohexane derivative and tert-butoxide. So whenever we see tert-butoxide, that is our classic E2 promoter. We know we're going to do E2. And we have a substrate that is a cyclic system. So whenever we do E2 on a cyclic system, remember, it's going to be very important to go ahead and, and draw out the chair conformation so that we know exactly what's going on. So let's draw a chair. And now remember, when I place the first substituent, I can do it kind of however I want. And so let's take this bromine and, you know what, I'm going to draw that chair again because it's a little too, I'm getting a little bit too uh, vertical with that one bond. So let's draw that again. Now, bromine going up, I'm going to put that right here. That's just where I feel like putting it. Now, if I put the bromine up right there, then one counterclockwise, one to the left, we've got methyl going up. Okay, that's a little uh, bad. Let's draw that again. Eh, not so good. Okay, methyl going up. So we've got a bromine axial and a methyl equatorial. So if we're doing E2, we know that we need to access a, a proton, a beta proton. And so we've got one here, and we've got two here, right? So which of these are available for elimination? Well, okay. They, first of all, we have to recall that it has to be axial, right? The only way for uh, for the uh, for the pi the, the the p orbitals to line up so as to generate the new pi bond, uh, they have to be in plane. They have to be anti paraplanar, and that is going to be achieved by uh, by by doing E two on the conformation that has both the leaving group and the proton uh, anti. Uh, first, first of all, axial and anti to one another. So this proton will work and this proton will work, but not this one. That one is equatorial, so that one is not going to work. 
Now, we have to recall some things about sterics. We know that terbutoxide is very, very, very bulky. Therefore, we're going to get the Hoffman elimination product. Right, so that, that uh, the the sterics, it's going to be a kinetically driven reaction. It is going to extract the proton that is more sterically available because of the reduced activation energy associated with approaching that proton. So over here we have a tertiary carbon. Over here we have a secondary carbon. So this proton is much more sterically available, and it is going to go for that one specifically. So we're going to get that, we're going to get that, we're going to kick that off that way. And so we can draw our product similar to the way it was shown here. Now we got the proton that was one to the right. So this is the proton that we got, right? We can even, if we want, we can even draw this on this structure. Now that we are clear on what, on what happened, uh, that is what happened if we wanted to draw the arrows on the original structure. And so that means the double bond is going to be there. Ugh. Okay, and then the methyl group, nothing happened to the methyl group. No chemistry happened over there, so that methyl is still there, and it is still on the wedge bond. And that is very important because we need to show the correct stereochemistry of the product. If that was a dash, it would actually be a different molecule. So, um, so that's it, right? We needed to know, first of all, that it was E2. We needed to, uh, in this case, it, we still had both protons accessible, but if this methyl group was in the axial position uh, over there, that would that would change a little bit. Not in this case, it wouldn't, but depending on what the base was, that would de determine how many protons were available for elimination. Um, and then uh, we also had to recall that this went Hoffman. If we had a very small unhindered base, we would prefer Zaitsev. We would prefer to go and get this proton. But we have a bulky base. We prefer Hoffman. So this is uh, the one it's going to get, and that's the product we're going to get. Okay, a couple of quick uh, multiple choice. So the alkyl halide 5S6R56-dichlorodecane is, and we have uh, some options here. So one, uh, first of all, we got to draw it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So here's 5, and we have, uh, we, okay, we have a chlorine on, we have chlorines on each of these, but we got to know whether it's dash or wedge. So 5S, 5S means that, it's got to be a wedge because we're going to go priority one, two, three, counterclockwise like that. This also means that this one has got to be a dash because one, two, three looks counterclockwise but is actually clockwise from the other perspective. So you can uh, verify this on your own. But this has got to be what's going on. So we might be tempted to say that this is optically active because we've got two chiral centers. And indeed, we do have chiral, two chiral centers. But what if we rotate this bond uh, 180 degrees? What are we going to get? One, two, three, four, five, and we've got the chlorine there. And then we're going to be here, and then one, two, three, four, and we'll have the chlorine now on the wedge. Right? That is what we achieved simply by rotating this bond 180 degrees. And if we look at this now, we see that this is meso. So this is a meso compound. It will not be op optically active, not optically active. The other thing that we could do is just look at this and say, this uh, two of the answers offer optical activity at differing temperatures. That doesn't seem to make too, sense. It's, it, too much sense. It's not really a property that varies with temperature, right? It's just, it has to do with the structure of the molecule. So it doesn't really make much sense that a molecule would be optically active at one temperature and then not at a slightly different temperature. But nevertheless, it was good to demonstrate for ourselves that this molecule is meso and therefore not optically active. Okay, next one. How many asymmetric carbons does the following compound contain? Uh, so we've got to see that we do have one, two, three asymmetric carbons or centers of chirality because they have four different groups projecting from them. If we were to get rid of this hydroxyl group, we'd actually have none. Because, well, or no, so that's not true. We'd have two, uh, but it would be then therefore achiral overall. But the presence of this hydroxyl group makes, uh, makes, uh, makes a little bit of a difference. But we do have a third one there. Uh, so there are three, and uh, that's all there is to that one. Okay, two more real quick. Systematic name of the following alkene. So we've got this alkene. We've got a pi bond right here. Uh, let's go ahead and number the, the, uh, the chain here. Uh, so are we going to go left to right or right to left? Well, we have to go right to left because that gives the double bond occurring soonest.
So the double bond begins on carbon three, and we also have a methyl on carbon three. So we do uh, have to realize that this is three methyl, uh, three heptene or hept three ene. So that alone makes us realize that it is going to be that one. And this is also an E alkene because we have uh, this, this group takes priority on this side and this group takes priority on this side and they are on opposite sides of the double bond. So E three methyl hept three ene or three heptene are equally valid. Next, the rate determining step in an SN1 reaction. So when we have an SN1 reaction, we have some starting material and then we have one step and then we have a second step. And this first step has a very high activation energy because this involves the formation of the carbocation by departure of the leaving group. Remember the first step in SN1 is that the leaving group leaves, which leaves a carbocation, which is unstable. Then the carbocation reacts Right? A nucleophile will attack whether it's water or something else, and that is a very low activation energy uh, because it's very favorable for the carbocation to react and generate a neutral product. So it is that first step that is very unfavorable, very large activation energy, rate determining step, formation of carbocation. Okay, so we want to state the relationship between each of the six structures at the bottom of the page and this carbonyl containing compound. So we have this is the this is the reference molecule, and then each of these we want to say if it is an, if it is identical to this, the enantiomer, a diastereomer, a structural isomer, a conformational isomer, or not isomeric. So this is a great great exercise for uh, seeing if you know what all these mean and you can identify these relationships. So let's look at this first one. Let's, uh, okay, everything looks the same up until here. Up, uh, up until here, this, it's all the same and now we have this, first of all, it's twisting up and then this methyl's on the wedge. Well, this is actually what happens if we rotate this 180 degrees. If we rotate this 180 degrees, we get that. Uh, and so what that means is that this is a conformational isomer, right? I mean, it's true that it is identical. It is the same molecule, but more specifically, it is a conformational isomer because it is a different conformation, right? We rotated one of the bonds. We would show a different Newman projection around this bond. So it is a conformational isomer. Okay, now looking at this one, this is sort of set up the same way as this one, and we know this is the same as this. But here, we go from the wedge bond to the dash bond. So we have inverted one of the chiral centers, but we did not invert the other chiral center. And when you invert one or more, but not all, of the chiral centers, you are generating a diastereomer. So this is a diastereomer, as is most easily identified by comparing these two structures rather than these two structures because these kind of are set up the same. So now in this one we can go back to looking at the original. So we've got this dash is now a wedge and this wedge is now a dash. So we have inverted both chiral centers or all of the chiral centers. And when you invert all of the chiral centers in a molecule, you necessarily get the enantiomer of that molecule. So these are non-superposable mirror images. Uh, okay, now looking at this, this looks like we flipped the whole molecule onto the, other, onto the other side. So we took this molecule and we just, like a sheet of paper, flipped it over under the other side of the sheet of paper because everything is right to left instead of left to right. And so uh, what happens when we flip it over, we would expect that this dash pointing uh, away from us is now pointing towards us as it is here on the wedge. And we would expect the thing pointing towards us on the wedge to now be pointing away from us on the dash as it is here. So this truly is just the other side of the molecule. This is the view of this molecule that someone would see if they were standing on the other side uh, than the side that we are on. So these are, this is uh, identical to the original molecule. Okay, now here what happened, uh, well we've got an additional methyl right here, that's not present over there, and we lost a methyl over here. So it's basically like we plucked this methyl and just stuck it over there. And uh, anytime you just rearrange the uh, the the arrangement of, of the atoms, right? If you have a different, if you have the same molecular formula but differing connectivity, that is a structural isomer. So this is a structural isomer of that because it has the same number of the same type of atoms. There's just a slight difference in the way it is rear it, it is arranged. It is uh, there's a difference in connectivity. So structural isomer. Now over here, almost the same, we do gain this uh, methyl there, but we didn't lose 
the original one. So we have an extra carbon and, th uh, well, two extra hydrogen atoms because instead of one there, we've now got three there. So we added a CH2. Now these are not isomeric because they don't have the same molecular formula, right? It's just a different molecule uh, altogether uh, in a way that is not isomeric. It has no isomeric relationship with the original molecule because there's extra stuff there. So that's great for clarifying uh, what all these words mean. And uh, that, uh, that's the end of this exam. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.